All right, any questions so far? Oh, do be what? Just early for you. Well, we, were, we were working over that one uh, triangular gizmo now that we're beginning to get the idea that with the things we're learning here, we're going to be able to start specifying sizes, dimensions, shapes, materials, all kinds of things that we could never do in statics. That's the point of what we're, we're doing in here. So we're looking at a few things in particular as we go through this. We've got two of them so far. Just for a quick review, bring us back up to speed. We haven't been here for three or four days. Normal stress. What was our symbol for it? Sigma. It's the lowercase sigma. Uh, sometimes there might be a little n in there just to imply it's normal stress, but we really don't use that for anything else. Uh, it could be that we have different stresses in different directions. So we might put a sigma x on it to, to imply that we're talking about whatever force in the x direction and the cross-sectional area perpendicular to that. It's always the case with normal stress, hence the name normal, the word normal, that the force and the area maintaining that force are perpendicular to each other. We'll look very shortly at the possibility of a simple problem like this. Then we'll look not at a plane uh, horizontally through this piece, but an oblique plane. And in that case, then we'll take the force that's there and break it apart into a normal component and we'll look at the normal stress across that. But then there'll have to be a shear component also across that piece. And so, so uh, uh, remember these are, these are imaginary cuts we're putting through that material. So we can do anything we need to with them to understand the entire piece. But in this case, um, that would be the normal component because that's the piece that's perpendicular to the area maintaining it. So uh, keep, a, keep an eye on that, that these directions are arbitrary because these cuts through this material are imaginary. And uh, so we can set up a coordinate direction however we want. But it's always true that the force is perpendicular to whatever area it is we're talking about. Notice when we do this type of thing, of course, the cross-sectional area changes in size because the area of this imaginary plane is different depending upon what the angle is that's through the piece. We also had the shear stress. What was the symbol for that one? As you get used to these different um, designations is pretty common. I haven't seen any a book that uses anything but these two. Uh, there's then uh, the shear stress, which is defined very much in the same way in that it's a force supported by some area. But in this case, the area and the force that we're talking about are parallel to each other. And that's exactly the type of thing that shear is. I hope you you are familiar enough with it. Shear is the, the sliding of two surfaces over each other, which is just what this, this uh, parallel component of the force would do. It would tend to make those two pieces, if the material is going to fail there, it would sh fail by that those two faces sliding over each other if it was in shear failure. So we've got those two types of stress. And we looked at uh, parts of both of those in that gizmo we were looking at. This piece here, hopefully I'm going to be able to figure out a way to put that into the video. You guys have it, but maybe, maybe uh, our guests won't have it. You know, don't forget, we're always worried about Ashley and how things are going for her in the Netherlands. And I'll that happens, yes. 
just in case she's running from somebody. What? She's an hour from Amsterdam. She's not worried about this. No, no. I don't know. Uh, I told her to, to keep us apprised of how things are going. Uh, we do have we do have one other type of stress that we can look at in these pieces. For well, at any one of the uh, at, at any one of the pin connections. Um, where we have two surfaces, two different objects, the pin and whatever it's holding are in uh, contact with each other. For example, we'll take just any one of them, it doesn't really matter. And we have one piece coming down like that, uh, held into maybe uh, one of the brackets by a pin that runs through here. We've looked at the possible failure of the pin itself as it could be sheared through by the opposing forces. Uh, maybe this, this bracket's being pulled up, the, the holding bracket is trying to hold it back down, that's going to cause a possible shear failure of the pin itself. But there's another type of stress in here that we need to worry about, and that's the fact that uh, uh, the the any one of these components is press, pressing directly on the pin and vice versa. For example, if I take a look at just this uh, component of the structure coming down like this, and I'll break it off. I'll put our, one of our imaginary cuts through there, leave the rest of it off, as that surface is pushing down on the pin, the pin is pushing back on that surface there, where the two objects are bearing on each other. This gives us concern of what we call bearing stress. It's not a very common mode of failure for these materials. Much more likely that these things will fail in either one of these other modes long before it will be a bearing stress failure. But it's still something we need to look at at particular times. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll give it a little B for subscript bearing. Defined in the same way all our other stresses have been. Whatever this load is, maybe we'll call it P over whatever area it is that's supporting it. This might seem very much like the normal stress we've already talked about. The difference being that normal stress was interior to the material. This is at an exterior surface where two surface, two materials, two different components come together. And it's the connection between those two that we're trying to uh, support as we construct this object. This is actually a real surface here. I've just eliminated the rest of it for the view, but this is where the material, if, in fact, we can put, uh, for example, a side view of exactly what we're talking about. And here's the hole here where the pin goes through, and we're talking about this surface right there, where the pin and the strut are bearing on each other. So that is a very real surface in this case. The possibility of failure here is that this material would crush somehow. not a very likely mode of failure, but a possibility. Uh, could certainly be a concern if there's impurities or uh, um, uh, uh, voids, uh, little air bubbles as the, as the steel was allowed to cool, steel or the aluminum was allowed to cool, the possibility that there were little air pockets in there makes it almost spongy. <coughs> and then uh, we have sort of a crushing failure there. Um, this was, uh, this is an occasionally a huge concern with women's shoe wear. 
because women love. Well, I'm sure, Doobie, maybe if you if you bring in your favorite pair of high heels on Monday, the uh, entire woman's weight, almost the entire woman's weight, is concentrated into a very small area. And depending on what the flooring is itself, uh, wood, marble, carpet, those aren't big concerns. But if you have a linoleum floor, I don't know if you have the linoleum in your house, but there are certain linoleums that are a little bit cushiony. They're, they're a little bit spongy themselves. Typically, uh, it's a type of linoleum you might find in a kitchen because you drop lots of things in the kitchen, drop heavy pots and uh, uh, beer bottles and other kinds of things. And if they hit the floor, they can dent the floor. Um, not uncommon that women's high heels would actually cause a depression in the floor. That's a failure in the floor material due to a bearing stress. So often uh, times, well, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I, I, I barely seem to remember I had it one time, seeing a sign at a place saying, no high heels allowed because of that very uh, possibility of destroying the floor, putting little dimples across it as if uh, as if a tiny guy on stilts had walked across the, the floor. So uh, that's that's one other type of failure here, and we can look at it um, with this object that we've got. Just pick any one of the pins. Look at the possibility of this type of failure. For instance, we've got this pin down here at A. And if we uh, look at that bracket at A, it's sort of a U-shaped bracket. And we're only going to look at the part of it in concern to us. There you go. Jake, see you can't you can't skip out on technical freehand sketching. Otherwise you won't be able to do beautiful and not so bad. Not so bad here. There we go. What I've done is uh, looked at this bracket here but cut it through to expose the bearing surface. Uh, the, the cut that we're imagining is across here. We've eliminated some of the material. But the bearing surface we're worried about is this bearing surface here. It's across this face that the force from the pin itself is being exerted. And like inward to the force of the wall? Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, that piece across the bottom AB, remember, is in compression. So the pin will actually be pushing in on the bracket just as we've drawn here. If we look at the pin itself. It's got a, a return, you know, a reaction force from the bracket. It's very hard to draw. Uh, action reaction pair with what's on the bracket. But it also, though, is seeing the force from the component itself all across that area, distributed over that area. So we have to see how to calculate that type of stress as well. It might seem like it's quite difficult. If I look at, at this uh, hemispherical surface from above, looks something like that. The force from the this bearing surface is uniformly distributed across there, we're concerned 
with the total load that represents, and we've calculated it from, from uh, the other things we've done there. The trouble is, remember, that this, this, bearing, this, this bearing stress we're worried about, it's the normal component across this circular surface that is going to do the crushing. It's this little component there. The rest of it is sort of a shear across that that it's it's the it's the little piece perpendicular to the surface that's going to do the bearing crushing that we're worried about here. So the trouble then becomes, oh man, we've got to go all the way around here account for the fact that in every place that normal component changes. It's easy enough to figure out what the area is, just the area of a, a semi-cylinder, I guess. But it sounds like we're, oh, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to integrate all the way around that area as this normal component changes with angle. Sounds like a real pain. And would be. You've all taken physics too, right? And I think you remember. Well, if you if you haven't, it's it's quick enough to uh, to bring it to mind. If you remember, in fluid statics, you were looking at the pressure on submerged surfaces. If we've got, say, uh, uh, some submerged surface here. And we're worried about the pressure due to the water bearing on that surface. We only had to take, uh, actually what I need to do is a curved surface, because that's what we're talking about here. So we could, we could even do, for some reason, maybe you have exactly the type of thing we've got there. Again, it's the normal component that we're worried about. And that's all difficult to calculate, except that once you do the integration, if you remember from physics too, I hope, what it turns out is you only have to worry about that area and the pressure at that point. And you don't have to do the integration around the whole surface itself. Sound familiar from physics too? A little bit? So all we have to worry about is not the circular area and the changing force around that area. We only have to worry about this area across here. And the force on that area, which we already know because it's the force in the component itself. Uh, the connection there. So for bracket A, we already know what some of those forces are. If you remember, this is 40 kilonewtons in that horizontal member. Is that right? 40, 40 kilonewtons across the bottom. So each of these little pieces total 20 kilonewtons. We don't have to worry about the distribution of that force. We just need the total force. So that's 20 kilonewtons if we're looking at the force inside one part of the bracket. And the area over which that force acts, this blue area in here, is uh, what, 25 millimeters, which is the diameter of the pin itself. And then the width of the component, which is also 25 millimeters. So this happens to be square at 25 by 25 square millimeters. The 
this right here, this isn't the pin. This is another view of this component across here. So it goes all the way down to that U-shaped yoke at the other side. I wish I could figure out how to get this smart board to work up there, but I'm having trouble with it somehow. I can't get the two to go at once. So we're talking about um, this little surface right there and its cross-section, the hole, but only one half of it because that was a, a double-sided bracket there. And so we get whatever that uh, whatever that bearing stress is. Uh, it comes out to be 32 megapascals. Compared to some of the other stresses, we had a shear stress of 50 and a normal stress of 160 thereabouts. Not that those numbers are directly comparable because each one of these exerts a different type of stress in the material itself. We had the original that was either trying to pull the material apart or push it in and crush it and, and cause it to, to uh, uh, fail in that way. Or the shear stress was just trying to rip them sideways or the bearing was trying to just crush it at an, uh, an immediate exterior surface. So the numbers of themselves are not that comparable. Uh, however, you can certainly see that uh, uh, there are differences in magnitudes in all of these numbers. So that's, so that's the force on both the surface that uh, the member in on the floor? Can yeah, because force? those are an action-reaction pair. The, the force on the, on the bracket is equal and opposite to the force on the pin because they're, they're caused by the mate of those two surfaces to each other. Any other questions? Because what I have for you now is a piece, uh, uh, an object for you to do. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay. It's uh, some kind of some kind of breaking object. We got a couple things we want to find. And I'll have to give you the limits because what we're looking at this class, remember, is the ability of certain materials to withstand these stresses. And so part of our design concerns will be staying within those limits because otherwise we're worried that the material itself could fail. So take a second to familiarize yourself with a picture. And then I'll put up our design limits. simple gizmo. <clears throat> As we pull on it with force P up at the top there, that's going to cause the attachment piece um, AB to become under a normal stress. And we want to make sure that that piece doesn't fail. Also, because of all the loads, the two loads here, plus the applied load up there, there's going to be a reaction force on the pin down at C. So we want to make sure that it can withstand the uh, shear and bearing stresses that are down there. All right, here's our design limits. Here are the things you're given as the engineering constraints. For whatever reason in this design exercise, uh, the a 
allowable normal stress in the part AB is already given. Uh, this is determined by whatever the material is. Uh, for whatever reason, perhaps this is known to be a certain kind of steel or alloy or something, which has inherent in it a characteristic ability to withstand a certain normal stress that is published by the uh, manufacturer of that material themselves. So uh, you have to go by that limit. If we find greater stress in that, we, we need to bulk up the piece. Well, we need to find the, the diameter of this as it is anyway. So we'll make sure that the area is sufficient such that we do not exceed this stress. Except that we don't want to be that close to this. So we're going to put in a factor of safety of 3.3. I'll let you think about how you're going to apply that. Because there are different ways to do it. Uh, and they all come out to be uh, the same result, if done carefully enough. The pin C has a shear limit of 350 megapascals. Also with a factor of safety of 3.3. This might be a, a company design limit, it might be a, a uh, um, some kind of National Bureau of Standards design limit. For some reason uh, they're determining this, the need to be, uh, to maintain a factor of safety of 3.3. Alright, so um, you need to determine a couple things, of course, to figure out what the load is in the uh, what the what the normal stress is in the component A B. You need to find out what P is. Not a big deal, I hope. That's the type of thing where you're doing in statics last fall. You also need to find out to prevent the shear failure in the pin. You need to find out what the reaction is in the in the pin C. Now, typically in statics, we always found the components CX and CY. But remember, uh, with what we're doing now. The shear is, is essentially non-directional other than it's across the piece parallel to whatever surface we're concerned with uh, uh, maintaining that for. So what you really need to find out is the magnitude of that support of the reaction at point C because we don't really care what angle it is across the pin. We just need to know what it is so that we can then size the pin, make sure it can uh, maintain that. of that little bracket 
that would be found with uh, uh, concern for the bearing stress. So yeah, I do have a number for that too. So we'll just put that in. The bearing stress at pin C, we'll want to limit to 300 megapascals. So I guess we can say less than or equal to on all of those. Yeah, if I can get these pictures into the into the video, it's gonna look fine. It's really showing up well. All right, any troubles? Everybody able to get started on this? you do with it? We will, shortly, yes, but not yet. What we're going to find out is the length AB has to do with another type of failure mode that we haven't looked at yet. You're going to need to because that's what you need to do to find out how big the pin needs to be to maintain this shear stress limit. Um, you're going to need to find out what P is so you can figure out what this stress is, and you'll need you'll need C to also uh, size the bracket so that the bearing stress is.
Everybody makes nice straight lines though. Uh, at least when they're horizontal or vertical. to think about. Not because it's particularly difficult. It, it isn't one if you just sit and think where can I apply this uh, such that it'll do what I want it to do. Um, but there are a couple of different ways to look at it. And there are some, there, there are ways to look at it that are wrong. For example, we have uh, the design point we're looking for is this diameter, but in the calculation here, that diameter is squared. So you have to worry, if I put it in there, is that going to square the factor of safety? Is that what I need it to do? Or is it going to put in the square root of the factor of safety, and that's not what I need it to do? So there's different ways to think about it. I'll give you a couple minutes, and then if you're still stuck, I'll spring you free. Has anybody applied that factor of safety already in some way? Okay. That's good. It's 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 uh, it's not a big trick. It's not a, a mysterious thing. There are just a couple ways it can be done.
However, we want a factor of safety 3.3, so we're not going to go up near anywhere near this 600. We're going to stay below it by the factor of safety. So those numbers are all given. What? 182. So you can see you lose a lot of your design margin. However, the factor of safety whether it's the safety of the user or the public or the safety of the machine itself, I don't know. It's better to apply it here than to apply it to the D because of the squared factor. But that's defined uh, industry by industry. Yeah. 
That's a lens. <laughs> a thick pencil lead. So I'll, I'll do it. You have the number right and the units wrong? I got thrown off on the units because we have mega in there and then we have kilo in there. Yeah. Uh, that, you've got to watch no those idea. in this class. It's vitally important, especially when you then go square because those squares can mean different things. Uh, you're squaring then that factor of a thousand that you might have screwed up. Mm. Would it be easier to make all the conversions beforehand? That's yeah. up to you. Just do it sometime and do it correctly. Usually it's easier to get things into the units you need right from the start. We're on camera here. We, I need one of those little red lights that goes on that says on on the air, yeah, right. so everybody gets quiet right here. So when and where and how you apply these conversions is is uh, a matter of personal preference. However, uh, generally it's easiest if done before you're into the equation. Because once you have the equations, even though these are simple, they're simple, very simple equations. So our limit here is uh, 182 megapascals. It might be easiest to make it right here before you put it into the equation itself. If you configure that we're going to want maybe millimeters or meters or something, but that's a little bit easier conversion than all these others. What's mega? The, the SI prefix mega. What? Yeah, 10 to the 6. So just take out the M and put in it, what it stands for. Right there. And then um, perhaps it's easier to just find the area first. We know the load to be the uh, the 40 kilonewtons. units sort of a step at a time as you go. Factor safety is already in there. We don't have to worry about it again. It doesn't have units. And if you do that, what do you get? Minus three, minus six. Six. Oh, yeah, that'd be okay. What, Doobie? No, that's not your, it's nothing face. Did you not get this? Colin, is that okay? Is that right? Those numbers? Comes out to give just that. You know that equals pi r squared or pi d squared over 4. And you can then solve for d. Yeah, that's more like what I got. 0 0.017 meters or 17 millimeters. Okay? What went wrong? Just he gave you a half a meter. Just the units? Yeah. Got the oh let's see, there you go. Whack with your phone. Now of 
course, uh, what if you are going to make a billion of these things and you want to use stock material for these and you find that 17 millimeters is not a standard material, a, a standard size that's manufactured and you'd like to use just off the shelf stuff because it's cheaper. Got to go bigger. Maybe 16 millimeters is available, but that could take you under your factor safety to 3.3. Maybe it doesn't matter. If I remember this number was actually 16.7, maybe you're still okay. Well, no, you wouldn't be. Um, it's, that would push you under the, the 3.3. And then if that part fails, somebody gets killed, your design notebook comes out, they calculate this the factor safety you actually used was 3.2 or 3.1. No sense going to court. You might as well settle out of court. You might have a prayer. Okay. What's like the average factor safety that most like, places use? Is it around that number? Or is it no, that's like, pretty high. That's oh. pretty high answer. But it depends upon the application. depends upon the concern. If this is a very cheap piece to make, you don't mind going to a very big factor safety, uh, at 3.3, because it's just not going to cost that much. You know, the, the greater the factor safety, it does come in terms of more material, uh, material handling, because not only you, you've got to pay for more material, but now you've got to ship, give or take, 3.3 times as much stuff as you would have had to ship before, if that's a concern. Um, but it depends on, on what the application is. If this thing fails, perhaps it's absolutely catastrophic and people will die. Or the machine will be completely destroyed. Or uh, maybe it's part of a ship and then the ship is uncontrollable or something. <coughs> Excuse me. It could be too that to replace that part is virtually impossible because it's so hard to get to it. So you don't ever want it to fail because you just don't want to have to dig, take the thing apart. You can imagine there's parts in the space shuttle that are terrifically difficult to get to. Incredibly expensive just to swap out everything, change a 10 cent piece, and then put everything back in. So uh, the factor of safety, even though it's at a safety, it, it protects different things protects lives, protects machinery, protects schedules, protects dollars. All of those things are concerns. What about the shear at pin C? Do they have that? Remember, once again, we're, we're doing very much the same type of thing. Hopefully, you uh, you pretty quickly have uh, know what the what the forces are in pin C because it's the same as the it's the equal to and opposite the forces on the L bracket itself, and we already know the horizontal and vertical components of that. And we just have to figure out the full magnitude of P. <coughs> Excuse me, but then. Um, Um, you also have to figure out the allowable design stress point, shear stress point in this. Again, it's a 3.3 factor of safety. Uh, could be just coincidence, those are the same. It could be, uh, 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 there, there's, there's a lot of different places where those things can come from. Because again, it depends upon what it is you're trying to protect. So that should be 106 megapascals. And that's got to resist some shear by the size of the pin C. Pin C is uh, is in is in double shear. Remember we talked about that. 
some of it in any one part of it. It's got uh, half the load. What, what was the total force C? Remember the magnitude of the reaction at C? Forty horizontal component, and then the fifteen plus the fifty vertical component. Should be able to figure out what C then is pretty straight away. Yep, seventy-six point three kilonewtons. And then at any one possible shear point on the pin. I guess we'll draw the whole pin because we've got the L bracket itself in the middle that has that 40, uh, sorry, 76.3 kilonewtons. And then in the bracket, holding the pin, that's uh, half of that load. Remember, on the pin, we don't care about the direction of that force C. The pin's circular and go in in any way. It could be the pin isn't circular, or the material is anisotropic, meaning its orientation is important. But in this case, it's just a circular pin and can go in any way. And so the direction of C doesn't matter, just its magnitude. And then it's these faces here that must resist that shear. And then that's what you have to size, and then from that you get the diameter of the pin. And then we're done. So what's the diameter of the pin? What did I hear? Nobody feels brave enough to venture. Colin, didn't you have something? Yeah. stock size might be. And then on Monday, see if you can't come up with the thickness of the brackets because of this bearing stress. Remember, what we need is this, is this uh, projected area across that opening. Sort of, uh, I tried to sort of uh, shade it in there. Uh, didn't quite come out in the top. So have that for Monday, have a good two hours. Any questions?